This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I want to speak to you about the great final separation. Would you pray for me that the Lord will give me the strength to preach this message? I, uh, I've struggled with it, but <clears throat> I know my role. I know what God's called me to do. He's called me to be a watchman. And I can't do other than what he commands me to do, <clears throat> no matter the cost. Father, I pray you help this morning by your spirit to, to communicate through me to this congregation and to all who would hear this message. Communicate your heart. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking you to sanctify this vessel. And speak your word with mercy and grace. Let it come forth not from my lips merely, but from your heart. Lord Jesus, we have only one goal and one ambition in this life. And that's to see you glorified and see your will be done on this earth. And that the church of Jesus Christ come through to its glorious calling. Now, Holy Spirit, come upon me. Let nothing hinder what you've been trying to say, I receive it, Lord, and I ask you to come upon me. Holy Spirit, seize me, lay hold of me, and speak through me, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Jesus said the gates of hell shall never prevail against his church. Paul said Christ loves his church. He said it's going to be presented to him on that day, sanctified Washed by the word, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what he said. But Paul the Apostle comes along, even though we have this promise that in the end of time, when Jesus comes, it's going to be a glorious church that he takes. It's going to be a prevailing, overcoming church. We stand on that promise. But in the meantime, the enemy is going to come and try to destroy that church. And Paul the Apostle and the other apostles tried to warn the church of what was coming. The Apostle Paul said, for the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away many of their ears from the truth. And Paul, seeing that, he said, I call heaven and earth I call the Father and the Son as witnesses to tell you, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Why is he calling God and Christ as a witness to what he's saying? He said, I'm telling you now that the only way to prevail against this invasion of false doctrine and false teachings and the focus on money the only way to combat this is to preach the word. And he said, I call you before God the Father and God the Son as witnesses to what I'm telling you. Preach the word in season and out of season. In other words, let no man hinder you from preaching a sound gospel. The sound gospel, the whole gospel, includes the cross of Jesus Christ. It's a sound doctrine of suffering. Paul, the apostle, when he said preach the word, he says reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That doctrine is of self-denial, the return of Jesus Christ, holiness, forsaking of sin. That which you do not hear in the church of the itching ears. The Bible said they're going to come with itching ears and they're going to heap to themselves teachers to scratch those itching ears. They're going to turn away from the gospel, the scripture says. 
You say, that doesn't sound like a prevailing church. That doesn't sound like what Jesus said would happen. But Paul the Apostle says, until that time comes, before and in the last days, there's going to be a struggle for the body of Christ. The devil's not going to lay down and say, well, the promises are there, so I can't fight. He's fighting because of those promises. He's rising up with everything in hell to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. He said that because there was a prophecy given to that there would be a great falling away. He said men are going to turn away their ears and they're going to turn to a smooth doctrine of the flesh. It's so clear in the scripture here. Many shall follow their sensuous ways and become uh, and the way of truth shall be mocked. Second Peter 2, 3. And in their greed, they're going to be exploited. He said, this is happening in the congregation. There's an incredible thing that's happening here. I used to think that in the last days, it would, it, that this would be ungodly pastors. Or, uh, those, Jesus said, the, the scripture said, there would be angels of light that come in the pulpit. They're really from the enemy, but they're preaching another gospel, another Jesus. And I used to think that these are men that are just gathering people together and influencing them. But that's not what it says. The Bible says, he said, they have itching ears and they are turning away from the truth and heaping to themselves teachers to scratch their itching ears. So it is not pastors coming and seducing the people. It's something that's happening in the church general where people are turning to the things of the world and the materialism and the love of money, which is called the root of all evil. God's not against you and I having money. He's not against you being blessed and prospered. That's not it. And this is not to condemn you. If you're a businessman, he, you are commanded by the scriptures to, to endure till he comes and you're to do your business and you're to be zealous and you're to be active and you're to provide for your family. But he said there's coming a generation they are going to have nothing but greed and covetousness. They're going to have what I would say they have done away with the period in their life. There's never enough, period. They don't, they don't say, well, when I get a million dollars, period, that's enough. They remove the period every, in every area of their life. Nothing is, is going to satisfy. And now we live in that generation that is creeping into the church and taking over the house of God. All over the United States, we see this American gospel of greed. This American gospel, as I heard one well-known preacher Being interviewed, he said, if you come to my church, I guarantee you will prosper. I guarantee you will make money. And the theme of the church is money will come. Thousands and thousands attend that church. And that's happening everywhere we go, this American gospel, because they see it on American TV. But you see, he's he's saying it's not the pastor's. There's a demand. There's a vacuum that's been created. And so they are, because of the demand, the enemy is having to raise up ministers who are ministering to that spirit of covetousness. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then it becomes an attraction to all those unsanctified men, those wolves in sheep's clothing that are coming just to fill a need. It's not pastors saying, hey, come to my church. That's, that's not it. It's, it's pastors coming in to fill that vacuum created by a spirit of covetousness in the house of God. Peter wrote a warning to the church to stir them up, he said. Remember what the prophets have spoken. Remember the words of Christ spoken through these apostles. He said, in the last days there shall come scoffers. Walking after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? Because all things continue as they were. Who are these scoffers? I'm telling you, it's not the drug addict. It's not the atheist. It's not the homosexual, in your face, violent crowd. It's not the secularist. It's not the communist or the atheist. These are those who've turned aside with itching ears to another gospel. 
They're scoffing and what they've done. They, you see, the only way they can live that life, the only way you can get rid of the guilt, the only way you can give yourself to the spirit of greed is to put out of your mind that Jesus is coming. And so they scoff at that message because it's, it's a message of condemnation and guilt against greed and against lust. And they, the Bible says, they're going to come mockers and scoffers and last day saying, where is the promise of coming? Everything continues as it was. And what they're saying, it's always going to be good. It's always going to be good. It's always going to be prosperous. They're saying, where is the sign of his coming? But let me tell you where the young people are not scoffing and laughing, but confused to hear a church. To hear a people of God preaching about the coming of the Lord. And they look at these lives and they watch these television programs. And these, they see all of this begging and pleading for money. Then they see this gold, gilded, candy, cotton preaching. And I tell you, these young people say, if Jesus is coming like they're saying, why are they living like he's never coming? Why are they reaching for, and Why? Are they living like we're living? Why are, 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 are they bringing our world into their world if Jesus is coming? Why aren't they going further and further away from the world? Why are they not separating themselves and getting ready for this coming that they preach about? There are some in this church and in many churches in this city and around the United States, people that sat under good preaching, solid preaching, sound doctrine. They have heard the word and they've, they have been growing in Christ. But you see, there's a seed in them. And so they are attracted to these voices and they go to these meetings out of curiosity where money and greed is emphasized. And they say, oh, I'm only going out of curiosity. I, I'm only going to go hear this man. I, I just turn on this TV uh, celebrity man because sometimes he says some good things. Yes, I'll tell you, 95% of it is good. It's, it's the 5% that will kill you. But the reason you do that is because there's something in you, the Bible says. There's something that says, maybe this man can make me wealthy. Maybe he can help me to find the secret to making money. Then money becomes the focus. If, if this sounds gloomy to you, I've got good news. In spite of what is happening in this world, in fact, the Harvard professor recently remarked the decline of Christianity. The decline of Christianity is one of the most remarkable phenomenon of our times. The, the lack of influence, the loss of power, the loss of authority. He said it's the greatest phenomenon in modern times. A Harvard professor. He said this decline, this loss of influence, a weak church that has no authority, no spiritual power. But that's not what Jesus is coming back for, the scripture says. Christ is not coming back for a church that's a den of robbers. He's coming back for a church led by the Holy Ghost and not by CEOs. He is coming back for a sanctified body of saints who are separating themselves from the world and all the things of this world, not letting it get a hold of their hearts. Now, what's God going to do to answer the foolishness and this doctrine of covetousness that is sweeping the world? How is God going to bring him back to this promise of a prevailing, overcoming church? He's going to do it by raising up spiritual Nazarites. Samson, Samuel was a Nazarite. Samson was a Nazarite. Paul was a Nazarite. A Nazarite took a vow. Some were under vow at birth as Samson. They took a vow of separation from the world. And that vow was taken by men and sometimes by women. It could be for a week, it could be for a month, a year, or for a lifetime. And this vow for men included uh, no drinking of wine. That represented no giving yourselves 
It means total separation from the passions and lust of the world around you. He was not to touch a dead body. And that symbolized, don't drink in anything of this world. Don't touch anything of this world that will rob you of the life and the purity that is needed for the Holy Ghost to work through you. And he was not to cut his hair. He was never to be shorn of his hair. Forget the seven locks on Samson numerology. I don't want to get into that. Samson knew it was not his long hair. He knew that that long hair never to be cut was a symbol. It was symbolic. Every time he saw it, every time the world saw this man is different. He doesn't walk where we walk. He doesn't talk like we talk. This man is different. He's set aside for God. This was a mark. Now, that mark alone, there's no power in separation itself. I'm telling you what God is going to do in the last day. The only way he can bring back the church to this prevailing mode, bring it back to the glory. He has to have a separated people, a Nazarite people that have made a Holy Ghost vow and led by the Holy Ghost. The more wicked this world becomes. I am going to turn to Christ with everything that is in me. I'm going to see God like I've never sought God before. I'm going to walk a different path. I don't care how many Christians say they can do it. I can't do it because Jesus is coming and I want the Holy Ghost in my life. Israel had been under bondage for 40 years. The church represented their powerless. And under the bondage and the fear of the Philistine armed the people. What is God's answer? How does he answer? What does God do when the church is under dominion of the enemy? Where there, there, there is no strength, there is no power to impact the world. He doesn't send an army on this occasion. He doesn't send angels. He finds one man and separates himself completely from the world. And when he gets this man separated and is convinced that this man will walk in that separation, that he knows that that's his calling in the world, that he's in the world but not of the world. Jesus loved sinners. He ate with them. But the Bible said he was also separated from sinners. And until Jesus Christ once again can find a body until they can find a people who are not being sucked in by the spirit of this age. Until they can find a clean and holy people that the Holy Spirit can move upon. Because that's what you hear of Samson time and time again. And the Spirit began to move upon him. Mightily. And you see him come, a lion come up against him, which represents the devil himself, who is a roaring lion. And the Bible said, and the spirit of the Lord came on him. And without a weapon, he tore that lion's mouth apart and killed it on the spot. Because the spirit of the Lord was on him. A thousand men come against him. There were 30, 30 of the Philistines come against him one time and he, he slays 30. And then on another occasion, a thousand come around him. And again, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Why? Because he was separated. And it was not just the separation. It was the Holy Spirit moving to a separated man, separated from this world. And for 20 years... This man judges Israel. And for 20 years, you don't hear of another miracle. You don't hear of Samson doing anything. You hear of no mighty works. You hear of no moving of the Holy Spirit. Here's a man who started right. Here is a man who knew he was separated. He couldn't touch the things of this world as long as he stayed in that place of separation. He had the Holy Ghost available to him, and the Holy Ghost would come upon him, and he was invincible when the Spirit of God came on him. And I'm telling you, though they would mock him and ridicule him, they feared him. And the church of Jesus Christ will never be feared. 
until it is a separated people, until the Holy Ghost is moving again through people. Not just knocking them over. Not just some kind of physical manifestation. But through a powerful word anointed by the Holy Spirit. And people say, I know that voice. That's a different voice. This city heard it when we moved into this place here on Broadway. We didn't come here with the agenda. We didn't come here with the program. We never knocked on a door. We never took a poll. We never asked people, why aren't you going to church? Why are there so few people going to church in New York? We never said, what would you like to have in the way of a meeting? You want the music soft? You want it loud? You want organs? You want guitar? We didn't ask any questions about the music. We didn't ask anybody. We were told to come here and preach the word and confront sin. And the Holy Ghost would do the rest. And when we, when we moved into this theater, all of Broadway said, that show won't last six months. They were angry. They, they were angry. And then folks, Broadway started feeling the impact. Actors start getting saved. David Davis is one of now pastors of the church in Jerusalem, in Israel. The musicians started getting saved. The singers started getting saved. And they cursed us. They tried to buy this theater back. The, lead, the people we bought this theater from came to me, offered millions of dollars. And one man pleaded with me. The man we bought it from pleaded with me. Please give me back my theater. I said, no, standing room only for Jesus on Broadway. Folks, it wasn't a program, it wasn't a book. It's because the Holy Ghost was in the pulpit and the Holy Ghost is burning in the people. Why? Because the Lord said, come out from among them. Be ye separate and clean, saith the Lord. Then I receive you as my son and my daughter. And God started cleaning up. We, I remember in the other church, I remember a whole row of, of, Cross-dressers, transvestites. There was such Holy Ghost power in this church. We didn't have to say a word. We didn't rebuke them. We didn't condemn them. But little by little, they started coming dressed as men, which was their gender. And some of them got married. And those that were married got straight. Why? Because the Holy Ghost was here. The Holy Ghost is in charge. But see, for 20 years, you don't hear from this man, so his spirit gets cool and he saying to himself, I, I don't want to live this separated life. That had to be his attitude because of what he did. Twenty years later, this man, first of all, he has a one-night stand in Gaza with a prostitute. And you see, the next few weeks, his hair doesn't fall out, judgment doesn't come, and, and he, he suddenly has a, a, a hook from the enemy. He, he's, he's thinking now, uh, I've, I've been too intense, I'm living too strict. Why not a little bit of... Relaxation, why not just a little bit of the world? And this is when he goes down to Zurich. Zurich is in the Philistine territory. And Zurich, the word itself, means a hissing voice. A hissing voice. A call. That's had the most luscious grapes of all the Mideast. He goes down, not for grace, but he's going through, and I don't even think he's looking for a, a prostitute. But you see, the devil's trying to say, we've got to stop this man. We've got to stop. There's a secret here. There's something going on there. And that's just what they're saying about what's happening right here. There's something going on. Be careful when you go in there. You're going to feel something. Be careful in there. They may get you. 
They can mock and they ridicule, but they have to respect the Holy Ghost. Samson goes to Sork and meets a woman who I believe was planted by the Philistine princes. And, and you know what Delilah means? Ease up. Take it easy. Relax. Don't be so intense. Look it up. And he falls in love with Delilah immediately. And he ends up in her home. And the Bible says, and he loved Delilah. What that means, he began to love the easy life. He began to love not having to carry a burden. No more worrying about the orphans of Israel or the widows in Israel. No more weeping over the poverty. No more, what shall I do, O oh God, to bring the house of the enemy down? Now, I put in my time. Now, I'm going to relax. I'm going to take it easy. And how, folks, Delilah's body went in the grave, but her spirit's still alive. And Delilah's still here today because she got religion. I said, well, Delilah got religion. And the devil moved into church. He said, I got Jezebel already planted in one church. I'm going to just bring, Jeze I'm going to bring Delilah back. And I'm going to come to a church that's supposed to be wide awake, looking for the coming of the Lord, intensely in love with Christ, intensely wanting to win souls, those who are seeking the face of God. And I'm going to come. Delilah is going to come and do her thing and whisper, you don't have to live such a strict life. A little bit of pornography once a week. These tapes that you bring into the house, the, these vile videos. I heard one preacher say, well, Christians ought to be mature enough to take it and not be affected. Maturity. A little, a little drinking, a little partying, and that is sweeping through the churches now. Party time. Turning to drink, turning to alcohol, flirting with the sexual nuances and, and all of the, uh, all of the cyber sex and all of the media sex. And we think we can just walk through this, that we can indulge this, and it's not sucking out our spiritual life. And Delilah is very much alive in the church today, draining the life, ruining pastors. We see it all over the world, absolutely ruined by pornography and all of these vile Things that we bring into our houses and we think we can do this and get away with it. We think we're too mature because even when Delilah begins to mock him, you see, three times he toys with the Philistines. Three times he, he not only grieves the Holy Spirit, he, he tests the Holy Spirit. Because, you see, he's not valuing now the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. He's not saying this is the most important thing in my life, that the Spirit of God be on me and move through me, because without the Holy Spirit, I am nothing. I have nothing. So now, this woman toys with him. What's the secret of your strength? And the Philistines say, you entice him so that we can bind him. But we've got to know the secret of his strength. And he knew the secret was not in his head, on his hair. He knew it. He knew it was the Holy Spirit. He knew it was just the sign of separation. And he said, if I lose my hair, in other words, if I truly lose the spiritual reality of this sign, if I lose the spiritual reality of it, not just the symbol of it, but the reality of it in my heart, I'm going to be as weak as any other man. And so he wakes up stripped and shorn in the lap of Delilah. And he gets up. He says, oh, 
I've done this before and gotten away with it. No big deal. And he walks away, and they bind him. He starts struggling and fighting. He's weak as a kitten. And he didn't even know the Spirit, the Lord, had departed. And that's the tragedy today of thousands and even millions of Christians sitting in dead churches not even knowing the Spirit of God has left. People living their lives and getting more and more attached to the world and its things and not even knowing that the enemy, that the spirit of Delilah has trapped them and they're being shorn in their spirit and in their heart of anything that could bring them through the last fires. But let me tell you the good side. You see... We don't have a mere man as our deliverer. We don't have a Samson. We have a God-man. We have Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who is our deliverer. And Delilah is no match. Oh, hallelujah. I believe the Holy Ghost has been dispatched by the Father and the Son even now. He, he is under mandate from heaven. Go, Holy Spirit. Go and deal with the spirit of Delilah. Go right into her house and chase out every preacher you find in that house. Convict them once again. Call them and woo them and tell them, I want to give them one more chance of the glory of God just as I did for Samson and chase every Christian you find down there toying around flirting with sin tell them get out while they can because it's coming down the roof is going to cave in you say how is it going to happen because the Lord said I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken I'm going to shake things up I don't know how he's going to shake it When you read all the prophets, when God shook nations, he started by taking away the the, the basket of uh, bread, he calls it, which represents economy. I don't know how he's going to do it. He said, everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. I'm going to shake everything. I'm going to shake those who are at ease in Zion. And I will shake those from Luke 12, 19. I was those who say, I will say to my soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease now. Eat and drink and be merry. But know that that was the shaking to come that very night. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Yet once in a little while, this is in Haggai 2, 6 and 7. I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, the dry land. And I'll shake all nations. And the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill the house. This house with glory, say the Lord Jesus. This tells me that not only did he do this when Jesus came the first time, he shook everything, the mountain shook. But this is the same Christ. He said, once again, one more time, I'm going to shake all that could be shaken. And folks, in this time of shaking, God is going to have a people that are being drawn away. I, I, we meet them now. We're meeting them from all over the world. Pastors who say something is in the air. Something has happened. And if, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're sitting here now and you're listening to me. Something has to be, you have to be hearing something in your spirit. That has to be something stirring in your heart right now by the Holy Ghost. If I am preaching the Word of God, and if the Holy Spirit is upon me, And if the Holy Spirit is in you, there's one thing he wants in this last day when everything is stirring. He wants men and women so separated with clean eyes, pure hearts and clean hands that are turning away. If there's been any flirtation in these things, backing away, asking the Holy Ghost for power and blocking away, saying, oh, Jesus, I want the Holy Ghost to come upon me on my job. I want the Holy Ghost to come upon me on the subway. And when I'm in church, I want the Holy Ghost to come upon me. And he said, that's when the mighty works begin to happen. That's when your family gets saved. That's when God begins to meet needs. When the Holy Ghost is free, free to move in our vessels. 
Oh, he's, the reason I've been preaching this in the few weeks, last six weeks or so, it's something God do in my own heart saying, David, move away. Get away. Don't go. Build your walls. Guard your eyes. Don't let those abominations into your house. Sitting watching TV, some of the filthiest stuff in the world, some of it written, produced by a homosexual community, and they're feeding your soul. Christians that can sit and watch R and X rated stuff and expect the Holy Ghost to move mightily in their families. Folks, I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not condemning anybody. I, there has to be something that wakes us up. There has to be something of the Holy Spirit saying, Hey, listen, church. Don't get seduced by the things of this world. Don't let it take your heart. Thank God for his blessings. I live in a nice home and I thank God. I have beautiful furniture. I thank God. I drive a nice, beautiful new car. And God never condemns me on any blessings he puts in my life. And I'm not condemning you, nor is the Holy Spirit. But that's the real separation has, has to do with this matter of the Holy Spirit. I'm separated. Call it negativism, call it legalism, call it everything you want. But I know that the only thing that's going to impact this world is a Christian, a true Christian, that is a vessel upon whom the Holy Spirit can shake and move and speak. Nothing that hinders the flow and the anointing. Will you stand, please? I have a question for you, church. Now, you know, if if this is your home church, you know your pastors love you. If they didn't, they'd be preaching you nothing but a smooth, sweet gospel. Make you feel good, but it wouldn't dig to the issue. Wouldn't get to the heart of it. Every, from this pulpit, Pastor Carter, Pastor Neil, Pastor Patrick, Pastor William, Sister Teresa, every one who preaches in this pulpit has one thing in mind, one thing in heart, that God be glorified through this people. We can't impact this city until we are separated from it, in it, but not of it. And I think there needs to be some opening of hearts. Which way are you going lately? Have you just been easing up and relaxing, saying, I, I, I can't take this anymore. It's too strict and I, I don't want to live that kind of life. Because I, I've heard say God's not a dictator. The Lord is not a hard taskmaster. As, and as one preacher this Christian life is like getting on a plane, sit back first class and order a Coke. That comes from the pulpit. No. He said, wake up, church. Seek my face. Weep between the porch and the altar. Stir yourself and, and long and look for my coming. If you're looking for the coming of Jesus and you believe that he could come at any time he chooses, 
then you're going to see, I don't want to be indulging when Jesus comes. I want to be a separated vessel. Now, Lord, I don't know how to finish this. I did what you told me, and I obeyed you. Now it's your part, Holy Spirit, to change lives and deal with grace, mercy, and love with your body. Lord, I start with myself, that what I preach, you would help me to live. It would not just be a voice, it would be a life dedicated and given holy and separated from the world. You said, come out from among them, be a separate and clean, saith Lord. Then I'll receive as my son and my daughter. And Lord, make this a sanctified church through the Holy Spirit. Lord, fall on this church. Holy Ghost, seize this church. Seize it as you've never done before. So that we see glory beyond anything we've ever known. You can still come while I'm talking. You that come forward, let me say just simple. I'm not going to preach again. Look this way, if you will, for just a few moments. If you can, you heard what I preached, but I want you to know that I battle battles just like you. And so does every other pastor. We, we have the enemy come against us. And we can look back over past lives and see failures. But you see, the Lord, by his spirit, dealt with those issues. He dealt with those issues. Because we believe the cleansing, healing, forgiving power of the blood of Jesus. And then we moved on to say, Holy Spirit, now empower me. So let me trust you that when the enemy comes in like a flood against me now, that you cause me to despise and hate all of these things that are unlike Jesus, that I could become more like Christ. If, if you do that now, if you have that desire, he will hear that cry. He'll hear that prayer and you're going to have to ask the Holy Spirit to come right now and show you you don't have to live under self-examination but there comes a time when the Holy Spirit says just be still let me talk to you let me show you things that hinder my moving my moving in your heart he abides in us but we just as sure as we cripple Christ with our unbelief we hinder the Holy Spirit from being able to do his work because of these things that we allow in our lives. Would you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, cleanse me of everything in my life that's unlike you. Oh, Holy Spirit, I know you have come to convict me and bring me to the fullness of Christ into a life of peace and rest. Holy Spirit, take over, take control. I ask you and I give you permission to expose to my mind and to my own eyes everything that hinders your work in my life. Now, let me pray for you. I want you to believe that, Lord. We're laying everything under your control. We are trusting you fully in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the love of Christ. That when we cry out in, for, in repentance that you hear and immediately, immediately, it's finished. There is forgiveness and you said I'm more willing to forgive than you are to confess. That's marvelous, Lord, and how you love us and you love your church. Lord, remove everything in this body. In me, in every pastor, every worker, remove those things, O oh Lord, that would hinder us when we gather together or when we're on the job or wherever, the things that would hinder. And, Lord, tell us what to do. You'll tell us. You'll say, that's enough. And you will convict us, and you will keep convicting us until we come to that place where we say, yes, yes. And then, Lord, every time we obey the Holy Spirit, more power comes. More joy comes. More victory comes. Lord, it's that simple. Help us to do that. Would you, everybody in this house, 
that wants the Holy Spirit to come upon you. The Holy Spirit's in you, and you want the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And that, when, when we, the Holy Spirit to come upon you is the releasing of the Holy Spirit in you to praise Christ, to praise Jesus without fear, without bondage. Would you lift your hands and just begin to worship Jesus? Worship the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. Let the Holy Spirit praise Christ through you. Praise the Heavenly Father through you. Lord, give us clean hands and pure hearts through which the Holy Spirit can move. You can't move just through this pulpit. You have to move through this body. You have to move through a body. Hallelujah. Lord, I worship you. Thank you for cleansing. Thank you for forgiving. Give us power now. Destroy the spirit of Delilah. Lord, awaken our spirits to seek you as we've never sought you before. To love you as we've never loved you before. This is the conclusion of the message.